welcome everybody. Today we have two guests, uh, Professor Markus Frommer and Professor Alina Nechporenko. Uh, they uh, came from the Technical University of Applied Sciences. Um, uh, Markus is a professor at Technical University um, of uh, Technical University of Applied Sciences in Bildau. And he um, is a head of the Department of Molecular, Molecular Bio Biotechnology and Functional Genomics there. Markus received his PhD from the medical faculty at the University of Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. Then he worked at the German Cancer Research Center for 11 years. And since 2007, he's a, a professor at the Technical University uh, of Applied Sciences in Wildau. And uh, Markus' research, research interests lies in genomics and functional genomics. Well, actually, it's broader, but... Yeah, and differential <laughs> gene expression, I have it on my list, biology of lower invertebrates oh, and artificial... <laughs> that's <laughs> what... Lower, uh, that's what... Yeah, time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I know Marcus from my time when I came to Germany and we worked together on the... We studied the anhydrobiosis of the tardigrades, also known as water beers and also molecular phylogeny. Uh, and Alina and Professor Alina Nechporenko is a professor at the Department of Systems Engineering, Kharkiv National University of Radio Electronics in Ukraine, and uh, since 2019, uh, also a researcher at Marcus Group, the Technical exactly. University, exactly. And uh, Alina received her PhD in the field of biomedical engineering from Kharkiv National University of Radio Electronics in Ukraine. And um, and today they, um, you will tell us a little bit overview of your projects, um, which connect molecular biotechnology and artificial intelligence. Right. Yeah. Okay then. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Veronica. And it's really nice that you could invite us. I'm really happy to see you again. <laughs> uh, we work together, as she said. Um, quite some years in a really nice project. Um, unfortunately, I'm not dealing anymore with these uh, cute animals called water peers or in science, um, tardigrades. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I will give you first a bit an overview of what we do, and uh, then we go a bit more into the details of one section in my division, uh, which is currently run by um, Alina. Professor Alina Neciporenko, and which is maybe <clears throat> most interesting for you, I don't know. So this part which covers machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. So um, um, Veronica already introduced um, that we are in Wildau, so normally nobody knows where Wildau is, but it's, um, it's uh, very close to Berlin, actually just a few hundred meters to the Berlin border, in the southeast, still in the circle of the trams or the metros. And uh, what you see here is uh, a view over our campus. As you see, it's an old industrial area from the year 1900, um, all preserved, of course. Here, um, for example, these old buildings. Um, and then we have uh, some new buildings. So I'm here, for example, or we are here in this very new building, uh, all more or less financed by the EU in the past um, five to 10 years. So um, as she said already, uh, we are the Division of Molecular Biotechnology and Functional Genomics. And um, I would give you a overview of what we do. Um, so, well, this is here our, our um, department uh, logo, and to say we are a university of applied sciences, and uh, I could say we have something like a mission and vision. This is uh, add application to academia and innovation to industry. So, um, other than, um, let's say, my, my, my colleagues at universities, uh, we have really not a focus in my department. We are pretty much driven by the opportunities we have because we have really good equipment. I don't go into the details of this, but actually I consider my equipment to be even a bit better than what I have seen at the German Cancer Research Centers. Of course, it's smaller, but there's not miss, missing a lot, I would say, um, even in, in the IT or in the hardware uh, sector. 
And so we are driven by the opportunities we have. I'm not, uh, I'm not forced by the university directorate to, to follow a certain mission um, or a certain field. And um, we are also a bit driven by the partners, um, which in many cases, but not all, are regional um, industries. So to describe a little bit, um, I like always to use this um, ancient um, Greek temple remainings here uh, with these three pillars, because these three pillars describe um, easily uh, with an image uh, what we do. So um, it's health tech, food tech, and eco tech, which could be translated to biomed pharma, nutrition, or um, food and um, environment. And um, to go a bit to the first and uh, to the most prominent column, uh, it, this is health tech. And here is a list of projects which we had or which we are still having. So those in bold letters are still active projects and um, about the last two. I will say a few words, but Alina is later going then more into the medical field with her research. So for quite a while, and um, you know still Lars, he is still in my group, we, we worked on the development of a vaccine development pipeline, which actually was very uh, interesting now in times of Corona. Um, then we had um, for quite a while um, a project line um, about biomarkers in rare disorders of the pituary. So uh, like, for example, acromegaly is a difficult disorder and um, early detection of this uh, disorder is um, really um, advantageous for the patients. Then um, still a bit we do, um, as I'm a biologist by education, uh, I, I like to do projects in the um, cross uh, connection to the medical field. So parasitology is always a nice field for the biologist. And so we had a, a line of um, projects and publications about leishmaniasis and uh, a lot about population genetics. Unfortunately, the researcher left quite a while ago. You know her, Katrin Kuhls. Mm -hmm. We still have contact to her. And I still have researchers I'm working together with. So just recently I met, um, maybe you still remember Ahmad, um, a researcher from Palestine. We just met him in Palestine, we both. Um, so what we are currently still doing is blood diagnostics with the mobile phone. I will later say a few words about this because there's also a company foundation in this area and um, some um, machine learning techniques around. Um, then we have one project with another company which arose from my department is detecting of parasites in stool samples of horses. So this is a lot with um, next generation sequencing. And then um, this is a bit vague, what I wrote there, unconventional detection methods and approaches. So I have one researcher who is always very eager to invent new, um, new techniques, especially in the nucleic acid um, field. And then um, one, one huge line uh, was new or better drugs against cancer. And I will just say a few words about this here. Um, well, so maybe I should click through because this is animated. and I um, forgot that it is animated, this picture here. So um, quite some projects um, led by um, another Ukrainian in my group. She was actually the first, Anna Grebenik, were around uh, this type of molecule, which you see here on the left, fullerenes. These um, are also called buckyballs. They look like little, little footballs. And the binding of drugs, for example, doxorubicin and um, then what we did quite extensively was irradiation with light uh, of cells which, um, which were exposed to um, this combination. This you see down here. Um, actually, with the mouse, unfortunately, that doesn't, this doesn't work very well here. Um, yes. no. Actually, I have also one. They don't work on this screen here. 
So with the mouse, I can do it, but the mouse is just jumping, unfortunately. So I will describe what is on the pictures. So uh, what, you, what you see on the le uh, lower left side is cells, uh, which are either cancer cells or normal cells. So the, the normal cell here is in dark and gray, and the cancer cell is um, enlightened with an LED. And uh, what is done is that the LED light or the light in general or energy in general uh, kind of excites the molecule. And then um, what you see there, ROS is reactive ox oxygen species. They, um, under these circumstances here, kind of uh, help the tumor therapy. And the um, idea is always something like using a double blade like uh, doxorubicin, which is anyway a tumor therapeutic, and the um, fullerene, which um, supports this um, under light or under energy consumption, this, uh, this cure of the tumor with reactive oxygen species. And on the, on the right side, um, you see the different approaches around. So there is um, something which is called photodynamic treatment under one, um, where this C60, this uh, fullerene is used as a photosensitizer, so it takes up light. Then there uh, is um, the drug delivery. Um, and then finally, there's a combination um, where we bring together these different approaches. I don't go into the details um, deeper here. Uh, actually, it's a cooperation uh, between several universities, which you see here on the top, and pretty much of this is financed by the German Academic Exchange Service. So, and then we have <coughs> in this first pillar um, from the section of unconventional detection or approaches, uh, we have one approach which is currently funded by the Volkswagen uh, Stiftung in a um, in a funding scheme where a lot of researchers applied in the under Corona times, and we were really lucky to get one of this funds, um, one of twenty among eight hundred applications. This is called Parallel World. Can polymerases go against the grain? And um, what you know from polymerases is shown on the left side. So it's an extension, um, um, it's a three prime end. So this is a very conventional idea. Um, and it's also um, shown on the right side here with APS is anti-parallel uh, DNA. So this is a conventional idea what polymerases do and how DNA looks like. But then there is also something we may have heard. This is a parallel uh, DNA strand shown in green here where you have the two five prime ends on one side and the two three prime ends on the other side. So very unconventional, and um, but known. And um, in my group, Dr. Jörn Glockler had the idea that polymerases could also uh, extend such a um, double helix here. And this is shown on the left side of a so-called five prime extension. Um, this is very far in the moment from uh, some kind of application, but if we can show that uh, we find um, conditions under which uh, this five prime extension works, and you find conditions under you uh, under which you observe this um, parallel uh, double helix, then you can think next of some um, applications maybe. So this is really kind of um, let's say mm, I don't know strange research. <laughs> So then a bit about the second column, and all in the second column is about food tech or the development of kind of novel food. Um, and this is all, all the products there are together with industries which are kind of very fundamental, like meat producer, bakery, somebody who handles coffee, um, etc. And um, what we have here is in, in bold letters, active projects and the uh, dark bold or black bold is um, one which I will briefly describe. So we have in the moment a project where um, a researcher investigates the maturation of fresh pork meat. So normally pork meat is not mature. It's always fresh meat in, uh, despite, for example, of, of wheat uh, meat from, from um, from deer or from 
from um, uh, cattle, which is normally matured for a while, and then it becomes better. With pork, it doesn't work, then it's spoiled. But this meat producer has some ideas to improve pork meat even with maturation. And what we do is the microbiology around and the especially pathogen detection and control. Um, then for a bakery chain, we were working on the encapsulation of yeast or bread dufflings. Um, dufflings in German is Teiklinge. So the idea behind is that you have a, um, a duffling with, um, with yeast for, uh, let's say, the higher hotel hotelery, where the customers would like to have a fresh bread in the evening. And um, a high quality bread is normally a yeast bread and not a deep frozen duffling. And um, that means for those people, they do not really prepare the dough by themselves. That means um, they would like to take it from the refrigerator, let's say at two o'clock, put it at room temperature for two hours and then put it in the oven that at six o'clock precisely, you have the fresh bread. And um, this is a bit difficult and either needs a lot of logistics um, or needs some special yeast. And we were investigating in the direction of either using alternative yeast from other samples, like for example, from beer brewing or some non-saccharomyces meat yeast. We also played around a little bit or um, crossbreeds of yeast was not successful or encapsulation. This is what we tried out. That means you use a capsule around the yeast then you bring some sugar um, around the yeast in the capsule and another capsule. And then these capsules under room temperature were um, resolved. And then sugar and yeast comes together and starts, this, um, uh, well, I don't know in English, gear process. This means the process where carbon dioxide is produced and then the dough goes, starts to, to grow let's say under pressing the button which is switching to room temperature um, so also kind of very let's say close to food project. then um, a project line which i like a lot uh, is from the coffee cherry into the cup so we have now the third project in a row where we were working with the coffee producer to improve the product in the cup and um, Normally, it's around the process steps in the coffee chain value, uh, coffee uh, processing uh, chain. That means um, from the harvest um, over the roasting into the cup. And uh, the reason why I'm involved here or why I'm involving myself into this uh, pro project is that uh, this, this coffee producer uh, guarantees to the farmers to uh, pay them three three times of the market uh, price on the world market price for the for the coffee beans. Um, and also I like coffee a lot. And, uh, we do the microbiology around. We do a lot of analysis, uh, analytics around. And um, this is for me, this is really always um, something fascinating because it's very close to the product. And um, so just a few words a bit deeper into new preservation methods for the production of homemade convenience food or ready meals. And I have one slide or two slides about this project here. Um, so we have currently in Germany here um, on the left side, left image, you see a 7 billion euro market for convenience food or ready to use meals, which you see here on the right side. So um, now it's about in the middle, you see bratwurst, for example. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about bratwurst, but how to con conserve bratwurst, for example. And the idea is that the customer would like to have um, something which can be considered to be a bit like homemade. And that means without um, classical uh, con uh, preservation methods, which in the middle is, uh, is written, either chemicals or, for example, heating a lot or so, so, and then uh, these, these dishes here, this food here normally doesn't taste so nice and customers don't like it. So the idea, and this is written on the right side here, which I cannot show now with the mouse, not very well, 
Um, so using biopreservation methods without any chemical additives, um, hopefully there's also, because the food does not need to be heated a lot, uh, there's also some reduced energy consumption in these processes. And then these, um, these um, dishes are more or less ready to eat and hopefully have um, an extended shelf life. So this is basically the idea, and we work here together with the company Esser. Um, and uh, this is some approaches we are following here. So some approaches are following um, so-called protective microorganisms. Actually, this is an idea which is thousands of years old already. It means um, you use microorganisms to preserve food, um, but sometimes you would like to go to go a bit more in an advanced or fancy way. It means um, to better understand. And um, so what we do here is an untargeted strategy. That means we, we just um, isolate um, known bacteria like lactobacillus, for example, and investigate a little bit what kind of antimicrobial agents they are using here, for example, mesine. And uh, as I said, this is a very, in, in principle, this is well understood. For example, this is there, there is a dairy product or cheese which use these techniques. Um, you can also follow a more targeted strategy as shown here in the middle. So to do a microbiome analysis and then um, specifically select, isolate and use some protective cultures. Um, so we have in my department a little NGS facility where we follow these ideas, or um, below you see MultiTOF um, and S analysis to identify bacteria and then work with them. Actually, the work itself is then done in the company. Or on the right side, you see the, um, this is not known very well, you see an approach where we combine. And um, here on the right side, you see something which you have seen already. This is this R ROS, reactive oxygen species. And the approach is a little bit comparable to what I have shown already in this other field. Um, now it's sonodynamics, and we use also sonodynamics in this other project to um, to um, bring energy into these fullerenes, which I have described. And here we bring energy into uh, molecules like, for example, berberine or, or um, other molecules which are um, sonosensitive. Uh, these are natural plant additives, which are anyway used for conservation. And now the idea is to use sonodynamics and these um, let's say, um, spices, yeah? for example, curcumin is a spice, you know, but you would use it here in a concentration not to taste it, yeah? because you don't want to spoil your bratwurst with, with curcumin. And um, then apply sonodynamics, that means ultrasound, and then hopefully achieve some uh, preservative effect. And um, it is not just by chance that, um, this approach here and the other approach are in the same group because the researcher who does this here is married to the other researcher. They are both from Ukraine, by the way. Um, so now the third column, just uh, in short, Ecotech. Um, so in the environmental field, we had a project where we investigated the microbial reduction of methane emissions from landfills or waste dumps. I should say this, is not, this was not very successful. Um, and we have currently one project where we detect and reduce biofilms in cooling systems. I don't go into the details of this. And I will say a few words about uh, a project where uh, the idea is to detect explosives in soil and in a high throughput approach. So a lot in my department is around high throughput approaches. So um, the project um, is called MultiBlast, so multi points already towards the technique which we use, detection of explosive at contaminated sites. On the left upper side, you see such a contaminated site. This is a for former production site in Brandenburg, and there's many of such sites where you fly, where you really can find 
huge amount of TNT in the soil. So um, actually there is two, there is several problems around these explosives. One is, for example, unexploded ordnance. That means mines or bombs or so, which are not exploded. And the danger, of course, is explosion. The other is that you have really, yeah, pieces which are in such areas here buried in the ground because people just got rid of uh, the TNT which they didn't want to use anymore and just buried it somewhere. So if you need TNT, you just need to dig at the right places. And the third, and this is the most important problem, is that TNT is uh, not only dangerous because it's an explosive, but it's a toxic chemical. And so it distributes in the groundwater and there need to be monitoring around these sites. And this is where, where we come into the, into the stage. Um, um, so what, what is needed is some risk assessment for these contaminated sites. And there is some, of course, standard analytical procedures, for example, tandem mass spectrometry. And that means normally you dig a hole, take out such a, well, let's say 200 gram of soil. So approximately this amount here, then you extract with methanol or something else. Um, this takes quite a while. The result is then in the end, normally after tandem mass spectrometry, a very precise um, measurement, how much in pico whatever, um, how much you have, how much TNT is at this site. The result is also you have 200 gram of, um, of toxic waste and you have one liter of methanol, which is also of course toxic waste. Um, and you have just you have just one measuring point. So what we do is we use um, a very small amount, just uh, one Eppendorf cup. This is shown down here on the bottom, bottom. We extract with one milliliter, and then we use a different method, with, which is Malvitov, which you can, as seen here, apply in high throughput. So you can easily measure 384 samples in one hour, approximately. Um, the resolution is not that high, I should say. So um, you won't get this high precision, but you get much more data points. And that makes it very interesting because then what you can do is, for example, you can bring a lot of data points together with um, uh, geodata. And this is shown here on the next, uh, on the bottom um, right image where we have, um, of a, of a map where we have concentrations and I think there is one more slide. Yeah, here we have it a bit more in detail. Um, so we can we can really, and this is a bit uncommon to do with Malditov, we can really measure concentrations. Normally you wouldn't do this. More, normally Malditov is more um, a qualitative um, um, method, but we can do it quantitatively. And then you, in the combination with geodata, you can um, bring them into the, into, for example, in our case, uh, on the smartphone or any other mobile device, because we programmed an app. And we can even model it in three dimensions, as you can see here on the bottom right, um, and show in different depths the different concentrations in a very visual manner. Um, unfortunately, the person who programmed this here has now left uh, to work for one of the companies which are associated. So this is currently, unfortunately, not continued. Means the analytical part is continued, but not this visualization part. So this was a, just a little bit what we do in terms of projects, but we also do some transfer. So uh, there is defined three pillars of transfer. This is patenting, this is entrepreneurship, and this is standardization. And in my division, we are active in all three fields, I should say. So um, we are in the moment doing a little bit in next generation sequencing patenting. So uh, one person in my department is even a patent officer and can, he's scientist, but he can write his own patents. 
Then from my department um, derived these two companies, Biomes and Oculize. Biomes is a microbiome analysis company. They have they were founded in 2017 and are about 70 persons now and still do their microbiome analysis, not for patients, but for customers. So they sell a lifestyle product. Um, they um, are doing quite well and they do this still in my department and Oculize was founded one year before in 2016 and they do my mobile microscopy um, on a smartphone and sell a product for beer brewers who analyze their yeast on site they don't want to bring it into the laboratory that takes too long and um, so they they sell this product um, on a very specialized market. And they are also still in my department. And then um, we do in the standardization field, so this is the entrepreneurship field and in standardization, we are both, and this is also from where we know each other, we are both active in the ISO and also in some cost action uh, charm. This is um, standardization of, um, harmonization of standardization in life sciences. So um, also horizontal connectors of the three pillars. Uh, we have a very good playground of devices and develop methods. Then we do a bit of lab digitalization. I will say a few words and then um, also uh, horizontal connectors of these pillars is machine learning and artificial intelligence. And now I come more or less to the end. So this is just a few of the techniques we have available in our department, so different mass specs, in NMR, next generation sequencing, qPCR, of course, microscopy and extensive lab automation and robotics. Um, I think for this, I have another slide to show. So this is one of our automation pipelines, which we are using for photoautotrophic microorganisms and screening. And um, we developed also a, bit, a little bit around. So um, we do also a bit of hardware development. So this is here, for example, LED platines, which we use um, under um, uh, micro titer plates. So you see this here on the bottom right side where we have such an LED platine where we can, um, where we can individually control every um, well of a micro uh, titer plate to um, play around with the light when we use photoautotrophic microorganisms like microalgae, for example. I didn't say anything about this um, area. And um, then what we also do a bit is um, development in the field of, um, this is here in the middle now, of electronic lab notebooks. So we are working together with the company Synode. Um, and then the last part will be given by um, Alina. This is the machine learning and artificial intelligence part. But before we come to this part, I would like to say a few more words because since the 24th of um, February, we have um, um, another field uh, of activity. So um, after the start of the war, we started um, a welcome IT school we together for um, Ukrainian students and organized a full semester together. Um, and this is our recent um, project, which um, started by mid of this um, year, the Bilbao Kharkiv IT bridge for lecturers in Ukraine where we currently employ 60 lecturers in Kharkiv. So Kharkiv is her hometown, uh, which teach on a platform there, IT subjects um, for students. So we have currently two and a half thousand students, right? Uh, yeah, two and, uh, two and a half thousand. Yeah, so we have currently in this bridge uh, project here, two and a half thousand students enrolled. Uh, which are teaching under our umbrella in Ukrainian language. I don't speak Ukrainian, but I have now in the moment like um, 65 Ukrainian stuff or so, um, four in my department and 60 currently teaching in Ukraine. And that was it from my part. So thanks a lot for your attention. So this is here our 
last journey two months ago on a, on a sailing boat. And now I will, uh, this is the department, I like now to hand over to Alina and she will go a bit more into these machine learning parts. And I have to now change the system here a bit. So I would like to tell you about uh, two projects. Um, and that we are dealing at the uh, department, um, Professor Froman, the Te Technical University of Applied Science, Wildau. Uh, they are mainly related to healthcare, healthcare field. But um, so um, my main, um, so I'm mostly dealing with medical data processing, and I'm working closely with physicians. Um, since uh, 2012, I think, yeah. And uh, I'll tell you so how uh, implementing machine learning models and uh, methods. And the first one is about uh, predicting patients with suspected myocardial infarction. This is a joint initiative of uh, Bedal Technical University of Applied Science and uh, Center for Connected Healthcare. It's led by Professor Dr. Schmeitzer. Uh, is cardiologist. He is a, a cardiologist and uh, Center for Connected Healthcare's uh, joint initiative of um, um, Medical School of Brandenburg and Potsdam University. Okay. And, uh, the initial idea was to uh, investigate the new uh, approaches of how to improve uh, the diagnostic values of um, uh, photoplethysmography data and ideally to replace electrocardiography with uh, photoplethysmography data. And on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the standard protocol. So how usually physicians can uh, diagnose acute myocardial infarction. And uh, it consists of three main groups. So it's clinical symptoms like uh, chest pain, a shortness of breath, uh, sweat, and tachycardia. Then uh, there's biomarker analysis, typical zirconin, but it can be also myoglobin uh, and other biomarkers. And uh, of course, Suggested electrocardiographic uh, change. This, I mean, uh, this, uh, change on the ECG curve. Here you can see. Okay, so here you can see uh, the standard uh, healthy ECG signal, so bigger stick complex. And then uh, on the right, so ST segment elevation is a uh, significant sign of myocardial infarction or ST segment depression or uh, T wave inversion, uh, all of them related to uh, myocardial infarction um, preliminary diagnosis, but um, not only uh, they uh, mean that patient has uh, this diagnosis. And sometimes without these um, indicators, there is also uh, myocardial infarction can be present. This is why we decided to investigate uh, the new data and uh, okay. Uh, you can see the uh, freely accessible public data set, uh, PhysioNet, uh, where you can find, so actually this is the largest uh, data set uh, with a, a 12 lead ECG uh, signals, and where you can, uh, you can find uh, 21,837 records uh, from uh, 80,085 80, uh, patients. And uh, in this case, uh, we used uh, short records, short term records, so 10 seconds lens. And uh, as you can see on the left, uh, the 
Kelsey e C G. Okay. Um, then uh, myocardial infarction, then um, different ST T combinations or how uh, elevation or depression, and other changes related to uh, other pathologies, and um, uh, for example, hypertrophy, and uh, we can also uh, see here a lot of metadata, like patient ID, age, uh, gender, so on, from other data, uh, for example, BMI, and uh, description of devices and uh, electrodes. And uh, uh, we decided to an analyze, uh, namely, heart rate. Variability. It means that uh, from uh, classical uh, figures the complex, we can identify this RR intervals, interbeat intervals, and uh, on the right you can see the ECG signal and this um, distance between uh, successful uh, RR, uh, so this RR intervals, and uh, under this ECG image. You can uh, uh, recognize so how this uh, heart rate variability uh, data can be extracted. So uh, on the x axis, uh, this is number of intervals. On the y axis, this is um, actually uh, distance between uh, two successful RR intervals, and, then, and it corresponds to amplitude on the y axis. In this way, we can obtain uh, heart rate uh, variability data, and uh, we calculated some standard um, me metrics in time domain, uh, so standard deviation of RR intervals and a root mean square of successive difference. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, from such a short uh, term uh, records, um, there's not um, there's impossible to uh, calculate some uh, frequency domain uh, measurement, but to do that, we just used uh, three minutes and so longer uh, records later. And you can see uh, here so short term norms uh, from they came from different literature sources, and um, there are I. I would say they are standardized, and uh, th that is why we can easily implement this uh, range for health data and uh, for uh, in, and compare this uh, with the other so unhealthy uh, data. The data that's out of this uh, health range, so uh, they are unhealthy, and we. Uh, Okay, so here you can see uh, this uh, time domain metrics for so interbit intervals, um, so with uh, heart rate and SDNN and MSD metrics. So, such an example. Uh, yeah, then we uh, implemented simple machine learning models. Um, the, the initial idea uh, behind this was to avoid some uh, high competition party, just do it locally on the laptop. That is why we tried um, these simple classification models. So, can nearest neighbors, radial basis functions, decision tree, uh, random forest, and uh, some optimization technique uh, applied to ra random forest. And we uh, got some, I would say, appropriate accuracy and uh, especially with random forest optimized uh, model. Yeah, and you can see uh, also the confusion metrics on the right. Uh, it corresponds to 20% of uh, this data. So it, I would consider this um, outcome as a um, promising for further research. So what has been done, we just uh, classified uh, healthy and unhealthy data, but we did it on a big data set uh, and uh, 
that is why I think um, it uh, gives us an opportunity to um, implement uh, other data, other models to uh, our own data, and now we are collecting uh, some new data. Uh, but it's not uh, so easy in Germany to uh, approach the patients. We just um, went through this ethical uh, commentary procedure. It was successful, yes, but then uh, we just uh, faced new obstacles. That, so you, you should pay for patients and you, you're not able to easily came, uh, come to uh, clinics or hospital and um, take some data from patients, especially it's related to uh, myocardial infarction patients. It's not easy to get such patients. So, yes. Okay. Uh, this slide, I want to show you some uh, research by uh, students here, and it's related to uh, arrhythmia detection. It's also cardiovascular disease, and so it's well known that cardiovascular disease, uh, so they, of uh, course, um, no, they take a leading place of death. So, um, globally, and um, that is why this cardiovascular disease focus uh, always um, interesting, so, and uh, we can improve uh, this accuracy. And in this case, it was arrhythmia, and uh, we gathered our own data, but it's not a big data set, it consists of uh, 35 uh, individuals, um, all of them are not patients, uh, some of them work at our department and another so from students and relatives, and then uh, we just also calculated time domain values uh, with uh, red uh, label. You can see uh, the data, all this uh, health range and with white is within this health range. And then uh, I, I forgot to say that in this case, uh, we were dealing with three minutes records. Uh, and um, we calculated also frequency domain measures and some nonlinear uh, param uh, parameters as phone career, a plot, and the trended fluctuation analysis. Yeah. And, um, one more approach, and then we use uh, different classification models, and in that case, uh, logistic regression classification showed appropriate results. And then we, uh, we developed a bit this approach and uh, transformed our signals uh, based on wavelet transforms to uh, image, so just um, uh, you can see this uh, frequency characteristics on the right and uh, feed it to a neural network, so to a convolution neural network. And um, now uh, so, uh, the, it shows some promising results, but it's a bit early to say how um, not too um, much data, and so it's undergoing now. Okay, and all that I mentioned above, so it's actually um, related to uh, photoprodesmography data. And as I already said at the very beginning, our idea uh, was to replace uh, electrocardiography signal with uh, photoprodesmography. Now it's quite popular and uh, so. Uh, it is also um, related to so this wearable, the smart wearable devices, Apple Watch, Garmin, in this case. And on this picture, you can see this heart rate variability uh, data, but they are noisy. And uh, they, this, this data has been obtained from Garmin device. Uh, and of course, uh, some additional noise reduction algorithms can be implemented, and my students already did it. But then we decided, uh, I got some funding, and we decided to buy uh, another sensors, 
um, uh, this thing was called Shimmer, and they um, uh, deliver um, more accurate signal, and we don't need some additional noise reduction and some outlier removal. Everything uh, is ready uh, to apply uh, some machine learning and so some classification methods afterwards. And the reason why actually uh, we want to replace ECG data uh, with PPG, PPG is simple, so how to get this uh, signals and inexpensive and non-invasive technique. And uh, we can calculate this matrix in time, frequency and non-linear domain, and then uh, elaborate, uh, or it's already partially done. This norms already exist. And then we can classify um, this data, at least unhealthy, and of course, uh, find some hidden patterns in this data. And here you can see um, the comparison uh, photoplasmography data and uh, electrocardiography data. Actually, so photoplasmography da uh, data um, um, for a normal um, condition for healthy patients uh, almost corresponds to ECG data. And uh, so if you don't know what is uh, photoplasmography, it is some optical sensor. Uh, that can measure um, the amount of infrared uh, lights that um, perfuse our uh, blood vessels and then so uh, either uh, reflected or um, okay. As a reflected of, I just put the word. Absorbed. Absorbed, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then we can obtain uh, such um, heart rate variability, so the similar uh, distance between uh, RR intervals, and it gives us this data as a basis for further calculations with this different domain. And uh, it's also nice uh, to mention uh, that, um, of course, uh, such an approach uh, based on some benefits of uh, Internet of Things um, in healthcare and uh, in particular in cardiology. Um, it enables real time monitoring, so, and then um, it, it enables to. It enables us or uh, patients or in individuals to have some um, preliminary decision making tools at home, just a, a point of care at home. But of course, uh, to get some remote medical assistance and in this case, reduce some healthcare costs to avoid the patient's hospitalization, for example. Yeah, and uh, we built some. Uh, IT infrastructure is based uh, on uh, the sensors uh, from firma, uh, from company Shimmer. You can see here. So we just uh, bought a few uh, development kits for photoplasmography me measurements and at the same time for electrocardiography measurements um, in order to compare them first and also myography. Um, sensors you can see here for other research purposes. And uh, at the same time, uh, we bought some powerful system, some solar with uh, four uh, GPUs, uh, A100 Tesla, 80 gigab gigabyte each, and it gives us also nice um, uh, possibility to perform any calculations that we need. So, okay, and uh, here you can see uh, data from Shimmer sensor, and uh, 
we also compared uh, not only the um, signal from uh, bracelet, but also from um, air sensor, yeah, and from uh, finger sensor, and actually uh, the most accurate uh, si si signal uh, came from uh, this uh, finger sensor. And uh, all of all of this sensor, uh, uh, so we can obtain all the data via Bluetooth, and uh, we don't need to recharge this uh, device. So the sensor during, so I would say, uh, forty-eight hours. So it's really convenient to have at home and do some measurements. But of course, uh, there are some problems related to. Um, Movements, are some noise. If um, in case with PPG signals, uh, they are prone uh, to this uh, patient movements. But it's a another topic. No. Okay, here you can see the IT infrastructure for um, IoT system, and here you can on the left you can see sensors and other smart devices that we are this hub. Um, transfer uh, uh, data. So then we are cloud, cloud uh, gateway to uh, streaming data processor in order to avoid some overloading and uh, then um, um, to go to data lake and uh, finally to data warehouse where all of data are structurized. And uh, afterwards, we can use um, a set of machine learning models. And um, the primary goal is to send some alerts so or some notification to uh, physicians and to patients simultaneously uh, in not file, so case. Uh, okay. So now it's all with cardiovascular disease, and uh, it's, it's time um, to see so my, microbiome research. Uh, now um, I would like to tell you about um, Microtsidel project. Um, it is under umbrella, or oh, it's BMBF project, funded uh, by BMBF and. Um, it's a joint project with Biomes, a company, a private company, and the, so uh, one of the startups uh, founded by Marcos also, and another company is Oculize. Uh, well, the initial idea was to analyze microscopic imaging, and that part, so I um, um, uh, I will omit this microscopic imaging um, that I missed, that I on, only started to work with within this project from this microbiomic analysis um, time point. Uh, but the idea behind is to combine uh, these two data sources, uh, so microscopic imaging from mobile microscopes, uh, and uh, so with this, I mean um, yeah, images of uh, blood cells. And uh, the first goal was to um, count uh, so how many uh, white and red blood cells in these um, images. And but uh, then uh, another part of this project related to microbiome analysis. And this data came from uh, stool uh, or darm flora uh, um, data so, uh, from Biome's company and they um, produce some lifestyle product. They analyze uh, stool samples in order to give uh, individual some recommendations. So not as a physician, but uh, some specialists in this um, Next generation sequencing and this area uh, dealing with uh, 
analysis of microbial data. And why is synergy? Um, the reason is that uh, for both uh, data, uh, uh, microscopic imaging and microbiomic, uh, uh, microbiotic data, uh, we are using uh, the same methods, so deep learning, uh, convolution neural network. It means that we uh, converted this microbiom data to an image and then uh, processing this microbiom data with convolution neural network. Okay, and uh, you can see also the task description, classification of uh, the microbiom into healthy and diabetes mediators. In this case, it is uh, diabetes mediators uh, type, uh, type, so type 2. Uh, and also well-known uh, disorder, and uh, which characterized by uh, hyperglycemia and so insulin resistance and the relative lack of insulin. And um, you can see that um, so about ninety percent of cases of diabetes um, so this. Um, other 10 persons so the primary uh, the type 1 diabetes and uh, gestational diabetes means uh, diabetes of pregnant women so it's only to uh, pregnant, pregnant women and according to some uh, worldwide statistics so we can expect that the uh, prevalence of uh, diabetes type 2 Type 2 is projected to grow beyond uh, 700 million patients by 2045. That is why um, we should search for new approaches how to um, identify this uh, diabetes type, type 2 early. Yeah, and uh, behind this, uh, we just uh, use some assumption, not, not assumption, it's already uh, proved um, by some researchers that uh, altered uh, good uh, uh, microbiota is associated with altered uh, glucose homeostasis. That is why uh, we decided to analyze uh, data from uh, normal from healthy patient and from patient Diabetes and it's interesting that um, microbiota from normal physiological uh, conditions and um, so this um, counts of cohort um, of bacteria for normal physiological conditions and for unhealthy conditions is the same, but the diversity differs. So uh, the diversity for unhealthy person. Uh, so it's really so inclines a bit. It depends on particular cells, of course. Uh, uh, I I have read many publications that um, um, give um, as an example so different combinations of bacteria um, and, uh, for uh, diabetes patients. There is no general um, uh, relations or general rules of how to um, distinguish between. Um, this uh, diabetic um, microbiota, and, um, I mean, there is no uh, numerical metrics or only some difference in di diversity. And if you uh, analyze uh, this microbiome data, um, so actually, so based on this, you can obtain uh, approximately 1,000 different intestinal bacteria, but it's not too easy to analyze this bacteria uh, using traditional approach. Uh, it's ambiguous, it's uh, time consuming, and uh, so high dimensional data. That is why we, sh we should implement some uh, another approach, and we found uh, in this uh, case. Um, some um, synergy with this convolutional network. Okay, here you can see uh, microbiome analysis um, data. So data for microbiome analysis. So it's 
in this data and so two samples. Uh, this, uh, it consists of 99 customer questions, so age, and gender, and, and so on. Um, body mass index, for example, and then microbial data, operational taxonomic unit, normalized counts, and taxonomic level, for example, and uh, um, links. On, on the left, you can uh, see uh, how differs this dimension for uh, each taxonomic level, so from three to one thousand seven hundred five for species. Okay, there are many methods how to cope with such a heterogeneous data, especially with high dimensional data. Uh, and you can see that our healthy group uh, comprises uh, 674 people and our diabetes group 352 people and um, from 18 to 80 so, um, years old. And for uh, the type 2 diabetes, so this is uh, 272 people. Yeah, and um, we decided to um, implement, in, in principle, well-known uh, technique. Uh, it is called heat map. And, uh, here you can see a uh, one-dimensional version of heat map, so barcode. And in this case, on the genus level, uh, actually, it is uh, some distance metrics obtained from uh, this uh, abundance vector uh, with a different uh, uh, intensity levels, so uh, with a different um, uh, abundance um, intensities that allows us to um, feed these to neural networks. But of course, uh, we did some um, additional. Um, Transformations with this data, for example, you can see that uh, from this one, uh, from this uh, linear uh, representations, we uh, firstly we came uh, from uh, color to um, grayscale representation, and then to uh, you, you can see this circle on the right and uh, some augmentation techniques, so with uh, different orientations and clipping and and so on in order to uh, investigate our data so more properly. Uh, here uh, there are three representations for genus levels of class and human and we experimented with uh, all of them but this genus was uh, more success successfully. Then we split our data set uh, we uh, have this ErasNet, uh, 55 popular um, uh, neural network, and uh, also experimented to play it with uh, batch size effort and frequency parameters. Here you can also see that, for example, from a um, number of epochs, yeah, so we can achieve this um, desirable. Um, Results, yeah, and uh, um, we also uh, shuffled our data so two times. This is why you can see two pictures. And finally, we achieved quite appropriate accuracy uh, with zero ninety nine uh, you know, healthy and zero ninety two uh, zero point ninety seven. So this um, a number of epochs, 50, we implemented also uh, threefold cross validation. Yeah, as I already mentioned, so we played with uh, parameters a bit. And uh, here you can see the different um, techniques, so this is flipping and uh, different representations of vertical, horizontal, and then rotating on uh, 90. 
about 180 and 270. Yes, and um, as I already said, um, we achieved um, so some appropriate result and um, I just want to repeat that the most um, significant result was related to um, zero, so zero point ninety seven. Okay, um, there is two more slides, um, but only with a brief overview from another project. This came. Uh, this project came from otolaryngology um, field. Uh, the initial goal to uh, early recognize the odontogenic uh, maxillary sinuses, some merged uh, pathology, and both dentists and otolaryngologists are facing so some the challenge to identify uh, this. Uh, so, I, uh, if you uh, take a look at the left, you can see uh, that uh, tooth um, penetrated this maxillary uh, sinus um, field. So, this um, uh, and uh, it's not too easy for uh, dentists or otolaryngologists to recognize it uh, at the early stage. The early, uh, as, as early as possible, and then uh, it will be um, some undesirable co consequence for patients. So we just trained UNET framework, and so just gather data from patients uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and this is uh, computer tomography data, and we labeled this data together with otolaryngologists when trade train the network and achieved some so, um, 0 0.97% uh, accuracy. And so it is used in practice uh, in Ukraine in two autonomous cl clinic, clinics. Yes, and uh, facilitate the daily routine of um, autonomous so some tools uh, that can help physicians uh, to deal with uh, such a um, pathology. Uh, okay, and one more example also related to otolaryngology. We developed um, and um, certified system for rhinomanometry. Uh, it's called Optimus. With uh, German colleagues, with Professor. Uh, uh, Dr. Klaus Vogt. Uh, this system consists of two models, so hardware models and software models, and hardware models comprises two sensors, uh, airflow sensors and uh, low pressure sensors. Both of them uh, register data simultaneously, and you can see the resulting data on the right. So there's two signals. Mm -hmm low pressure things and airflow. And then we can uh, calculate some uh, coefficients, so resistant, resistant coefficient, and um, we can assess the nasal breathing, and not only subjective as patient uh, does, but objective assessment of nasal breathing. It especially uh, helps in a case uh, when uh, otolaryngologists um, are in a doubt whether they uh, should uh, do this uh, surgery with nasal uh, septal deviation. And also insurance company are interested in such a tool, uh, such uh, surgical uh, interventions cost, uh, cost really so, um, too much. And uh, our coefficients, our system, and together with our coefficients, um, allow to so avoid some unnecessary surgery, for example. But not only for surgery, for uh, any objective assessment of nasal breathing. And our resistant coefficient or nasal resistant coefficient 
doesn't depend on any rational um, uh, peculiarities. On, uh, it takes into consideration both regimes of uh, laminar and uh, turbulent regime. It's interesting to know that uh, turbulent, in this case, turbulence gives us, so it's an indicator of healthy breathing. And um, we can also calculate it. So it's based on Reynolds number, but I'm, I'm, I don't go now into, into the details. Okay, if this system, as I already said, was certified, so it took a long time, so more than five years for the uh, entire project. And um, uh, we sold, uh, we sold so a couple of systems, but not in the European Union, but uh, so it should be certified in the European Union. Okay, now I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. I think we have a few minutes for questions. I already see a raised hand from Arthur, so thank you. Go ahead. Right. Uh, thanks very much for two wonderful talks. Uh, that was really, really interesting. And and uh, as I work a little bit and also in the field of uh, biomedical machine learning, uh, that that's really up my alley. Uh, I've got two questions, though. Um, so regarding your sort of decision on, on the on the formulation of the classification problem that you've been looking at, uh, in many cases, and that was in the re recent mo most uh, talk, in many cases, you, you look at the formulation of classes as a healthy and unhealthy, right? Uh, but for example, in the case of infarction, it would also be very interesting to look at the very rare cases, which uh, from the machine learning perspective goes into the direction of anomaly detection. And it would also make your uh, data set very balanced. So uh, I'm wondering what are your thoughts around that? Can you have you have you looked at uh, respective class formulations like this? And my second question would be uh, to the point of representation learning. It seems that in many applications, um, you're looking at some sort of a pre-processing and 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 pre-formulation of features that that are done by a specialist and i think this works quite well also it works quite well in my experience but i'm wondering if there is something computer science can do better in order to do a proper end-to-end -end representation learning so yeah those are my two questions thank you so regarding the first question of course uh, <laughs> It's really um, in, interesting. So it's, uh, I would say it's crucial point to find these hidden patterns in data related to particular myocardial infarction. What has been done? We are only, as we already mentioned, we are only only classified between healthy and unhealthy data. And the reason why we only did this was the lack of data, actually. Let, lack of this particular data, and especially... Uh, lack I of thought data. so, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's an elegant solution, though. I, I, I like it. Thank you. Yeah, so, and um, we uh, use that uh, physiomet data set, quite famous data set, and um, our... Hypothesis um, together with uh, physicians or was um, first of all work with this really ultra short records with 10 seconds. But usually they work uh, with ECG in order to prove uh, this microbial infarction. But our idea was how to recognize it without um, physicians' input, but easily at home with. All also with uh, short records, but not with uh, ECG data, but it's a bit complicated to have it at home and measure properly for uh, individuals, but with PPG signals, but with appropriate accuracy. And then, so such as preliminary decision-making um, tool. But of course, for the, uh, this patient, uh, should we add going to um, quite detailed um, um, examination with other um, it's a but um, the reason was to uh, notify uh, the physician 
uh, whether this uh, patient sh should be hospitalized or not. And this way also re reduce some healthcare costs. And uh, of course, it's interesting uh, primarily goal to find some uh, features in data that are hidden, um, features are relevant, uh, re relevant namely to this myocardial infarction as a um, main indicators of myocardial infarction. <laughs> Not so easy, but so we're working on it, and uh, the main uh, hindrance, the main um, ob obstacle is to uh, find um, from the data, and especially data from myocardial infarction patients. Uh, the time period is short, and so um, uh, they come into hospital, and there's not um, much time uh, for decision. And um, yes, it's crucial to identify these patterns. And I ha I have several um, ideas of how to do it, which methods implement this kind of uh, feature engineering, I, I would say. And then this fe feature uh, can be um, so used as an input um, array for uh, machine learning methods. Okay, and um, I hope um, I answered, or at least partially answered your question. Uh, yeah, and yeah, as I already said, how to replace ECG data with uh, PPG data and in a way that this data deliver us this um, meaningful patterns, meaningful uh, hidden patterns in data. Uh, relevant to um, acute myocardial infarction. Um, it's challenging uh, because not only myocardial infarction, there is this um, acute coronary disease uh, that can uh, have the same symptoms or the same um, indicators in, in, in signals. And then we should decide whether and how to proceed further and which particular Better. Yeah. Understood. And uh, with regards to bypassing this, I think that was a wonder, wonderful um, segue to this to this point again. Uh, to bypass the feature engineering step and 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 doing it more end to end. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? I mean, obviously you use CNNs uh, mm -hmm. um, on the data that was transformed to look like an image, but would you? consider using any other techniques without transforming the data into image like format yeah, I think so I already uh, I had some ideas and I um, investigated this hypothesis uh, in my um, doctoral research but with other data with breathing signals with airflow signals but I want to uh, implement um, almost the same approach to uh, uh, photoplasmography data and probably uh, to uh, electrocardiography <coughs> data. And uh, it is related to nonlinear methods, so nonlinear uh, peculiarities of this nonlinear features in data. And it's partially known from a uh, Poincare diagram, but uh, there is um, room of um, opportunity to implement some other metrics from um, Cow, cows theory and there are some publications there are many publications but uh, still no norms for these non linear metrics and in this field i want to um, make some more efforts with this data just uh, fascinating uh, i'll be curious to to uh, follow up on that later on thank you Thing. And regarding your second question, so how to um, pro probably replace experts? Yeah, and in this case, experts are physicians, and uh, usually they label our data sets. So this expert um, input from experts are, is also so means uh, it means a lot. And how to implement, for example, some. Um, other techniques or some unsupervised learning. So um, when we are dealing with unsupervised learning, okay, we can um, clusterize this 
data, and we can distinguish uh, so between the different uh, classes, but uh, there is no uh, good interpretation and there is no understanding why and for which reason uh, we obtain that and that cl clusters. So that is why we are still uh, working with experts and so still using this approach. It is. Thank you. Thank you. A question that was uh, kind of related to Arthur's second question. So it seemed like uh, with your uh, CNN-based analyses, the general recipe was take a take a data set, find a transformation that makes the data set look like a picture, apply the CNN to the picture to do the binary classification into healthy or sick, either for myofibrillar yeah. lung function or the um, microbiome diabetes stuff. Um, and I'm just wondering, I'm wondering about that intermediate step, the, the, the transform from the original space of the data to something that looks like an image. It seems to me like there's a huge number of ways you could do that, that might produce very different results. And so I'm wondering how, how sensitive are the results you get on that step? And if there's any kind of, um, you know, a priori, uh, you know, fundamental way you can make the decisions on what would be an optimal transformation with respect to differentiating the groups you want to differentiate. I think it's really a good question. Uh, and so I can um, explain so how, or the, which obstacles we already faced in, in this context. We uh, made so, several experiments and then, so just implementing the same approach, so transferring this micro data to images and then feed into a neural network, but so different results. And we um, asked also how, how it's possible, actually. And then we revealed that uh, um, company um, Biome uh, changed a bit bioinformatic pipeline. And this caused this difference and really big difference in results. And this is a question of reproducibility. How to make this uh, pre-processing of data and this workflow so reproducible? Actually, yeah. And now we are working on, on this and uh, it's a crucial point actually. Otherwise we are not able to uh, elaborate some uh, metrics so, uh, uh, to make uh, this but versatile, um, yes, it's, it's, it should be properly <laughs> investigated. We, we just implemented this uh, as an approach, uh, as an idea of this synergy project, so converted this microbiome data to um, image, but um, it depends on pre-processing, it depends on, on so how this microbiome data um, uh, has been processed and sample, sample prepare and other things. And then uh, bioinformatics methods also um, can um, affect this. So there are some many, many um, points that should be standardized. So ideally it should be standardized. And now um, actually there is some standards so how to deal with pre-processing of data. And um, I'm not an author of this standard, but I'm closely, I was pretty close and so I know the standard, um, this is about pre-processing of, pre of a next generation uh, sequencing and I'm, I know this standard uh, as an expert of this uh, data processing and integration ISO group, uh, but actually I'm not sure that uh, people are willing use this standard as a standard but um, for example i'm not sure that company biomes use this standard so there is plenty of versions of bioinformaticians uh, pipelines and, and um, all of them differ one from another and so of course all of these factors affect this uh, transformation, and then we can obtain different results. So it should be properly investigated. And, yeah, it's only now I would say we're, we're at the very beginning of this approach, but it works, and uh, it's we, we proved it on 
another with another pathology with uh, Hashimoto syndrome, and from uh, this particular bioinformatician pipelines, and it also works. Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay, I think we are over the time already. <laughs> so thank you very much. And everyone who is here in the classes is very welcome to join. If you have questions, want to discuss more, we will be in the lounge. So thank you. Thank you again for coming and uh, giving a talk. And